Thanks to you for coming to the uh, conference on web privacy and transparency uh, that was run by the uh, by Princeton Center for Information Technology Policy. My name is Ed Felton. I'm the director of CITP, and I want to welcome you all, and I want to thank the people who have made this possible. Um, uh, first, thanks to uh, the, organi the organizers and conveners of this conference, uh, Arvind Narayanan, Solon Barokas, and Joanna Huey. Um, and uh, uh, thanks uh, especially to Laura Cummings-Abdo, uh, who uh, has uh, handled all the logistics in uh, a seamless way as, as usual. Uh, and finally, I want to thank uh, the Sarnoff Fund for supporting the, uh, for the financial support for this conference. Uh, rather than uh, giving you a speech from me, I will hand off immediately to Arvind and Solon for the, uh, uh, for the tutorial. Thank you, Ed. I'm going to use this uh, mic over here, if uh, that's OK. Are you picking up the audio? Perfect. Excellent. So I'll tell you a little bit about web privacy and transparency and what we mean by transparency, and a little bit about the uh, uh, Princeton Web Privacy and Transparency Project, WebTAP, and how it connects to the broader set of research that's happening in a number of research groups uh, around the world, and uh, uh, you know what are some cool new things that computer scientists are discovering, how uh, it's leading to change online, and how uh, some of this is also scary, and where things are going, what are some future questions, and so on. So, um, and the, you know, I'm going to talk about this for the first half hour, and then I'll hand it over to Solon, who's right over there. So let me start with something blatantly obvious that I'm sure all of you are familiar with, which is that when you go to a website, let's say New York Times, the majority of the content on there is in fact not being served by the New York Times. So here's a screenshot of that, and you'll see highlighted in red, there's a video over here, there are a bunch of ads all over the place, and there's also a social widget over there that's coming from Facebook. Oh, and if you're wondering why Mubarak is seeking a new term, uh, that's, that's because this uh, uh, screenshot is actually from a well-known paper by Jonathan Mayer, who's right over here, that's going to be on the first panel with, uh, with John Mitchell, and it's part of uh, this growing body of research that I mentioned at the beginning. So what's interesting about this is not only how much content is coming from other parties, but the fact that whoever this video provider is, knows that you just visited the New York Times, and if you later go to CNN, they know that you visited CNN, and they can connect those dots together, right? And a lot of these, what we call third parties, which are these embedded content providers on this page, are in the business of compiling profiles of your browsing activity. And what's interesting here is not just what this picture shows, but also what this picture doesn't show, and in fact cannot show, which is that the majority of these third party trackers are invisible. They're not even visible to you on the page when you visit it. They're what we call bugs or beacons or pixels or a variety of names. Uh, they're uh, you know, hidden scripts and images on the page that uh, uh, have the sole purpose of uh, tracking your browsing online. So that's essentially what I mean by third party online tracking. It's sites other than the one that you're visiting that are typically invisible that are compiling profiles of your browsing history. And this happens every time you visit uh, almost any website. So you might wonder, who are these companies? And who has access to these profiles or dossiers or whatever you want to call it of your browsing history? Well, it's just these guys. <laughs> this is a, a famous line by a company called Limo Partners. And this is only talking about the, uh, uh, the advertising technology landscape. Granted, that's a big part of what is contributing to third party tracking. But that's still you know, only one industry segment. There are also social widgets, analytics, and a variety of other things. And I can't even pretend to understand all the complex business relationships between these guys. I know that there's been a lot of consolidation in the years since uh, this chart was made, but there's also been a lot of new players in the space, and the business model evolves quite rapidly. And so this is a very, very complex ecosystem. And, uh, but the you know, undeniable fact is that there are a lot of companies out there that are compiling these profiles of your browsing history. In fact, one statistic that I find very interesting is that apparently there are 64 independent tracking mechanisms on a typical top 50 website. And this comes from a study by Ashkan, who's going to be on our third panel today, in fact. So this might be very familiar to you, but that's only because you're ahead of the curve. We're still in a world where a lot of people are not aware of the reality of third party online tracking, including a number of what we call first parties or publisher sites, that is, the sites that you're visiting, the New York Times and the CNNs of the world. And uh, uh, my favorite example of this is from the UK's National Health Services website. It's, you know, uh, it's a regular web page, and this one happens to be up on syphilis, so you might, if 
you're, if somebody's visiting this page, they might really care about the privacy of that and not want uh, you know, random companies on the web to find out about this. But uh, one of the interesting things here is that there is a Facebook like button. Uh, oh, it looks like uh, five people have clicked it. Um, I don't even know what that's about. But what's interesting here is not the five people who have clicked it, but presumably the hundreds of thousands of people who visited this page but had no idea that there was a Facebook like button on there and that Facebook knows that they visited that page, right? And if they choose to on their servers, they can connect that with that person's identity uh, if and when that person logs into Facebook. And in fact, the uh, NHS website you know, was also unaware of the consequences of putting a like button on there. And so when this was reported to them, uh, they promptly removed the like button. But of course, there are thousands of other pages out there uh, and websites who are not quite aware of the constant online data collection going on through these third parties. You might think you're deploying advertising technology on your page, but uh, in addition to that, uh, there's all this profiling that's going on. So things start to get more interesting and less intuitive when you think about what are the various things that companies can do uh, with these data, uh, with these profiles that they collect. And in particular, if uh, we start to ask what can they do, do using data mining and machine learning, then the answer becomes very complex. Let me give you some examples of these. Uh, this is a TED talk by Eli Pariser. He's talking about something that he termed the filter bubble. And the idea is that there are all these information systems online, whether it's your newsfeed or whether it's uh, uh, you know, uh, news websites, et cetera. What they're doing is that uh, in order to maximize click-throughs or whatever the purpose is, they're learning what you're interested in and feeding you more information of a similar kind uh, in order to maximize the click-through rate. And what he claims might happen as a consequence of that is that you're fed information that constantly reinforces the views that you have. And the idea is that this puts each person into a bubble of their own ideology, and they get increasingly isolated from all of the other uh, people who browse the web. So that's the worry about the culture bubble. Uh, there are a variety of others. Legal scholar Ryan Kahlo worries that digital advertising is a form of market manipulation. And what he's talking about is that ads may be tailored not just to your interests, but in fact to your psychology. And we know that these things are possible using powerful machine learning algorithms that we have today. And this is a Wall Street Journal uh, study about websites that vary prices and deals based on people's personal information. And uh, you can imagine how that can lead to a variety of ethical consequences. For example, tailoring prices based on your past behavior. <coughs> right, and so when we look at all of this, here's, here's at least my take on this. I'm not claiming that all online tracking is bad, or even that most online tracking is bad most of the time, and I'm not claiming that all personalization and all of this uh, uh, you know, tailoring is bad either, but what is really unfortunate is that there is a huge gap in information and understanding between what's going on in the web and what users know about this. So I think the panopticon is a really good metaphor. The reason that the panopticon was bad was not because the inmates were being watched, but in fact, there is this huge, what we might call information asymmetry uh, in uh, you know, the people who are being watched not knowing who is watching them and when they were being watched. And that you know, strips away control and choice and all of that, uh, which we might want to have in this kind of system. So let's try to look at what's happened when people have turned the light back on the watchers. And my favorite example of this is the Wall Street Journal investigation called What They Know that ran, I believe, from 2010 to 2012. Uh, this was a tremendously influential and, uh, and to me, a really uh, effective study that uh, involved both technologists and uh, people in the media. This was uh, led by Julia Ingwin, uh, who's going to be, in fact, our keynote speaker today. I'm, I'm sure she's going to say a little bit more about this. But let me just say that this had a tremendous amount of impact. There were a lot of websites, for example, that said, oh, we didn't know there was this third party on our website that's doing this. We're going to remove that. Or a number of uh, um, uh, service providers who were doing tracking or profiling said, uh, based on the public outcry that resulted out of investigation and reporting from this, that they were going to change their practices. So this is the interesting fact that I think is the basis of a lot of the research that I want to tell you briefly about today, which is that whenever we do measurement, it seems to have a surprising level of effectiveness. And I call this uh, perhaps the unreasonable effectiveness of measurement. And you know, there's a couple of different reasons for this, I think. And one is that it fixes uh, this information asymmetry. And that means that without measurements, consumers live in a world where they're not able to make informed choices about which websites and services they interact with. 
right? If we lived in a world where it, with no car mechanics, then the used car market, for example, would be flooded with lemon cars, right? Uh, we know about this concept, it's called the market for lemons, and in fact won a Nobel Prize when uh, the economist George Ankeloff uh, wrote about this. And I think it's a very similar phenomenon in online privacy and data collection as well, just shining the light on this and uh, making it very clear to consumers uh, what is happening with their data enables the market to correct itself to a certain degree and function much more effectively. So the press and uh, the public want to have a public debate about uh, the effects of uh, tracking and profiling and uh, discrimination and so on. And measurement allows a much more informed public debate on these things. And finally, regulation and enforcement, even when uh, laws do exist in order to ensure compliance and enforce them effectively, you need measurement to figure out the facts on the ground and, uh, and for those actions to be based on uh, you know, uh, actionable forensic information. So in all these ways, I think enforcement has been really effective. But let me tell you what is the really ambitious thing that computer scientists and others have been trying to do in the last couple of years. They've been asking the question, what if oversight of online tracking and personalization could be automated? Right, what if you could have machines do this sort of on a web scale? And how might that happen? So oversight of online tracking, it's relatively easy to imagine how that could happen. You write a bot or a crawler that constantly scours the web and whenever tracking is going on, whenever a company is placing cookies or tracking you in some other fashion, it has heuristics, it has uh, uh, code put into the crawler in order to be able to detect and report that. So that's the basic idea behind oversight of online tracking. But things get complex when you consider the fact that online tracking is not just cookies placed on your computer, which you might all be familiar with, but the fact that there are a variety of other ways in which websites can track you, that even though they have the same effect, ultimately, uh, they're you know, increasingly technologically sophisticated. So what do I mean by that? What are some sophisticated tracking methods? Well, it turns out that pretty much any functionality, any API you put into the HTML specification, it can be uh, used in an unintended way uh, or abused in order to track people in some form. Let me give you one example of this. Have you heard of the Canvas API that's part of HTML5? Yeah, some people are nodding, right? Did you know that the Canvas API can be used in a very, very clever way to track devices uh, when they come back from website to website? And let me show you how that can be done. So here's a picture, and it looks like there's a problem with my PowerPoint, it's not rendering correctly, but uh, that's actually on purpose, you'll see in a minute what I mean. So you go to a website, what's happening is that there is JavaScript on that site that uses the Canvas API that executes a series of function calls through the Canvas API. And the Canvas API is something that allows websites to easily draw and render textual and a variety of other information uh, through these function calls that are accessible through JavaScript. Right. So that's what the Canvas API is about. But what this clever piece of JavaScript is doing is it's rendering a particular uh, sentence. Can you look at the sentence that's in dark green and see what's interesting about it? Does anything occur to you? If you can make out the letters individually, anything funny strike out? It's got all the letters, that's right. And why do you think they might be using all the letters? Because it turns out that the way in which your computer might render a particular letter on the screen is going to be typically different from how somebody else's computer might render the same letter. And when you put all those letters together, you get a lot of information about that computer of how it renders that text on a pixel by pixel basis. It depends not only on your uh, underlying hardware, it turns out, a graphics card, but also your graphics library and your computer, your operating system, and specifics of your browser, and so on. And because any part of this tag can vary from device to device, it turns out that rendering this particular pattern in text onto the screen and reading that data back as a sequence of pixels gives you a lot of information about a computer that's going to be the same whenever this computer comes back to a particular website or to a different website, but it's probably going to be different when someone else's computer uh, visits that website. And so that's the basis of Canvas fingerprinting. It allows you to assign a fingerprint to a computer that I'm not claiming is unique among all of the computers in the world, but has a fairly high degree of entropy. So if you combine Canvas fingerprinting with other types of fingerprinting, you might be able to uniquely uh, uniquely identify a device every time it comes back to your website. So this is obviously quite creepy, and you might wonder, why have I never noticed this? Why haven't I uh, seen this kind of picture when I visit a website? It turns out that the JavaScript can draw this completely invisibly and still read this back. 
So you never see it, but the website uh, can draw this on your computer and read it back. So that's how Canvas fingerprinting works. And let me tell you what I mean by automated oversight of tracking mechanisms such as these. Let me tell you very quickly about a study that uh, we did in collaboration with uh, KU Levin. And what we found is that having built an automated engine that can uh, go to any website and use uh, a set of heuristics to determine if that website is using the Canvas API in a legitimate manner or if it's using it for Canvas fingerprinting. We found, in fact, that among the 100,000 sites we looked at, this was used in over 5,500 sites. And there were 20 different providers or third parties who were providing this service uh, to the websites that we tested in our study. And I claim that you know 100,000 is not even large scale. It was just our starting point. We, in fact, did a 1 million site study, but that was not in time to uh, make its way to our published results. And we're getting to the point that we can execute this on a fully web scale. Right. And so whenever there is a type of tracking or behavior that, co uh, that uh, consumers are very uncomfortable with, we have the ability to now to not only do this on a web scale, but to do it on a continual basis. In fact, just two nights ago, our collaborator at Leuven, uh, Ganesh, emailed us to say that he had found a new and very significant uh, provider of online fingerprinting services, and we're seeing uh, what, what to do with that information. Um, but, uh, but to quickly tell you what was the effect of our study, uh, you know, when it got when it got attention, uh, immediately people started to back off from deploying Canvas fingerprinting. In fact, the biggest provider of uh, Canvas fingerprinting at this uh, said uh, they they've now stopped doing this. And so every time one does a measurement study, it does seem to have an impact on online privacy. So that's one key point that I wanted to emphasize. Okay, I said we wanted to do automated oversight of tracking as well as personalization and discrimination, other things like that. I've shown you an example of how you do automated oversight of tracking. But um, you know, automatically determining if a site is putting you in a filter bubble or is tailoring prices and so on based on your past behavior, that seems much more challenging to try to measure. How might one try to do that? Well, uh, let me put it this way. All the examples that I showed you before, the filter bubble, uh, pers uh, advertising that's uh, you know personalized based on your past behavior, or uh, varying of prices and deals and so on. These are all you can you can think of all of these in machine learning terms. They're all instances of differential treatment. But the way you might view this in computer science and machine learning terms is that there is user data that goes into some kind of machine learning system, and that classifier, if you want to call it that, makes some decision about the user to show a higher price or a lower price one ad versus another ad and so on. And so this problem boils down to having input-output access into a machine learning system, being able to control the inputs and then measure the outputs, and use that to determine what might be inside this black box. And that is the fundamental uh, computer science challenge that a lot of researchers have started ta tackling in the last couple of years. And let me show you a little bit about uh, uh, you know, how that's led to cool results. So the fundamental basis of this is that you might want to deploy bots, basically, that browse the web. And different types of bots, really, that behave like different types of users. Uh, an affluent versus a less affluent user, or a typical user of uh, uh, you know, one country versus another, one ethnicity versus another, one gender versus another, and so on. And then they might compare notes about what prices they're getting, what ads are being targeted to them, what offers they're getting in the email, and so on. And so this is the crux of the matter. This is the, this is the uh, technique that computer scientists are now starting to perfect and develop. And this allows us to detect, measure, and even reverse engineer various types of differential treatment based on personal data. Of course, after this is a whole ethical question of when do you consider a, per a particular type of differential treatment to be problematic, uh, and when is it OK, and so on. Now, fundamentally, you know, this is about transparency. Uh, we might expect that uh, transparency might, uh, as I was saying a little bit earlier, allow the market for privacy to function better. It might also have the effect that consumers might uh, look at this and go, oh, maybe things are not as bad as I thought they were. So uh, you know, I'm more comfortable browsing online. So as researchers, we can afford to take a relatively neutral stance on this and uh, reveal uh, what is happening online in terms of tracking and personalization uh, to the public. But of course, there's, there's got to be another whole level of public debate to be able to come to societal conclusions about what is acceptable and what is not. So let me tell you briefly about uh, the Princeton Web Transparency and Accountability Project. There are many such research groups uh, that are doing this, and you're going to hear from some of them uh, in, the, in the panels today. And so we've been looking at both online tracking uh, so far. I showed you an example. The Canvas fingerprinting study was part of that. But also we're starting to look at various types of personalization and discrimination uh, more recently. 
And uh, I want to give a shout out to the grad students. And the, there have been uh, many grad students, postdocs, and undergrads who are part of this project. Uh, Steve Englehart, Pete Zimmerman, and Chris Eubank have been uh, the three people more responsible than anybody else for really uh, building out all of this infrastructure and doing this research. So let me tell you quickly, so I, I showed you conceptually how you might be able to detect or reverse engineer this sort of differential treatment. But uh, uh, let me show you diagrammatically how, what our architecture looks like. What we've got going on is fundamentally a Firefox browser that's uh, browsing a whole bunch of websites, 100,000 of the example that I showed you. We've, uh, we've done bigger crawls and so on. And what's in between here? What we're doing is basically we're essentially, if you want to think about it this way, wiretapping our own connection uh, to the internet. In more technical terms, we're using Midim Proxy, but it's also combined with uh, a browser plugin that sits in the browser itself. And what this is doing is it's got a fine-grained ability to record and capture the interactions of the browser with the websites that it's visiting. Right? So that's the key. Uh, technical infrastructure that everything else is built upon. And so all of this goes into a database that collects contents, cookies, and JavaScript of various kinds to support various kinds of analyses. But that's not enough. What we also need is the ability to control this Firefox browser, automate all its activities, and make it do what a typical user might do in the course of a normal day's browsing. And the key technology that enables that that we're using is something called Selenium. It's, a, it's called the Browser Automation Framework. That's not quite enough either. The input to Selenium must be something that's based upon real users' activity or something that we have scientific reason to believe is the way that real users behave that we can feed into that so that we can make the system behave sufficiently realistically. Uh, so these are all components that we've built. A variety of others have built similar tools, uh, uh, which are substantially similar, but also have some differences. Some people emphasize crowdsourcing instead of this uh, automated browser. Um, people have built uh, statistical tools. So our analysis scripts are kind of, um, you know, we, we write a different analysis script for each kind of uh, test we want to run. But some people have been uh, trying to come up with a unified correlation engine for all kinds of analysis they might want to run. You're, you're going to hear a little bit about that in the second panel. Uh, people have also been really trying to tackle the question of causality detection. How do you prove that a certain behavior over here causes a certain output over here? You're going to hear about that as well. So there are a variety of research groups that are working on uh, you know, various um, aspects of this infrastructure. But this is a very high level overview view of how a system like, th like this might work. So you know, this is a um, multi-year long computer science research question involving many, many researchers. And the reason for that is that I've described it in simplified terms, but there are a variety of challenges in order to get this working right. And one of them is that the web just fundamentally resists automation. We've been putting a lot of effort uh, into doing that because the web you know, was not designed to be automated. It was designed for. Uh, for human viewers. And also, it raises some ethical challenges, because a lot of the things that you might want to do in the course of this measurement is very similar to automated activity on the web from bots that we might want to prohibit. Right? So that leads to some ethical as well as practical challenges as well. Uh, statistical rigor is a, uh, is a huge deal. And we didn't realize how serious this problem was of proving that uh, uh, some action causes some output uh, until we found out from colleagues and uh, you know working in other areas of science that uh, uh, we had to go and read books like uh, uh, field experiments. This is a manual for uh, you know uh, doing uh, medical experiments, for example, right on rats and such. Uh, so all of those statistical controls that scientists and other disciplines have to think about, uh, you know, most of those are applicable here as well. So it's got that huge component to it, and you need to get all that right before you can draw statistically sound conclusions. Uh, and finally, one of the uh, challenges that I think is still largely unsolved is that a variety of these interesting personalization or discriminatory effects might only arise based on some physical world interaction that the user might have. For instance, many companies are now uh, getting into the business of when you walk into a store, giving you a personalized deal or a coupon or a, or a price based upon your online activity. And I can uh, name many examples like this, but the fundamental bottleneck here is that it's going to be hard to measure this purely based on a web-based environment. So how do you tackle that kind of challenge? Are you going to have crowdsourcing? Are you going to uh, find some way to trick the system into uh, showing its differential behavior uh, using purely web-based methods? Uh, it's a tricky challenge. So uh, you know, there, there have been many interesting results that have been found about uh, online personalization. It's leading to this great public debate. You're going to hear about a system called X-ray. You're going to hear about a system called Bobble. You're going to hear about a system called AdFisher. 
I wanted to uh, throw in uh, one uh, sort of a little bit of a cautionary note in some of these uh, studies that are being conducted. And just like in uh, you know, medical experiments and pharma experiments and such, the publication process has a bias against negative results. We're seeing a little bit of that in this domain as well. And let me show you one example. Uh, this is a paper called Crying Wolf on the price discrimination of online uh, airline tickets. And uh, Nick Nikifarakis, in fact, is one of our panelists, is going to be on the first panel today. But what these guys did was a really thorough, multi-month long study of trying to look at what everybody assumed was just happening on a, uh, on a ubiquitous basis, which is price discrimination of online airline tickets. And what they found is that the personalization that does happen is based upon factors that are, that are only affected by your current search, maybe, you know, maybe what time of day you're doing that search, and, uh, and things like that, and not based on your, really on your history, the history of your past behavior, uh, your cookie information, and so on. And that was a surprise to everybody. But what happened is that the study really didn't get much attention at all because of the inherent bias both against publishing negative results or even when you report on negative results, uh, you know, people have a, um, a much more of a preference to look, look for results that tell you uh, that uh, something really bad or something really interesting is going on online. So this is something we need to keep in mind. There have been about a half dozen results of this nature so far uh, that uh, people haven't fully grasped. There are a variety of uh, uh, things that we, are, uh, we assume are happening online, but it turns out not quite to the extent that people assume. Uh, in fact, uh, our own research group, when I talk to people about this, we get a lot of feedback uh, from someone who might be convinced that a per particular site is profiling them and showing them articles based on their history, and then we go and investigate it. It turns out to be random variation or A-B testing or something like that. Of course, A-B testing is also a concern. We've seen how Facebook's A-B testing has been a huge ethical problem lately in the emotional contagion study, uh, but uh, we need to keep in mind the different types of personalization that happen online and uh, uh, you know, use these scientific studies that are being made to inform the conclusions that people are making. So we were having a brainstorming, a little bit of brainstorming about this yesterday uh, among some of the panelists. And uh, people were wondering how to make sure that these negative results also get attention and get incorporated into people's mental models. And someone suggested that they should have instead uh, uh, titled this paper, we went looking for airline price discrimination. And you won't believe what we found. <laughs> you guys know how these. Uh, headlines have been relatively successful online, so you know, maybe really that's the strategy. So let me end by saying this. I've told you about how online measurement of privacy and personalization, et cetera, can be very powerful. I also want to emphasize that this is not an activity that happens by itself. It's a highly collaborative activity that, uh, that relates to all of these different types of activities. Uh, we're interested in talking with privacy advocates to see you know, how these measurement results can be better used in the kind of um, uh, outreach that they do. We're interested in talking to tool developers. Uh, Peter Eckersley is going to be on the first panel today. Um, I would, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to love hearing from him about uh, the Privacy Badger tool that uh, uh, EFF has been developing. I think he's going to say a little bit about that. And we're going to have a discussion about how empirical measurement can contribute to these tools that people are building. Uh, obviously, there is a big overlap between these measurement results and the press. Uh, in both directions, actually. Personally, I've benefited a lot in figuring out what technical questions to investigate by looking at what the press sort of hints at based on rumors and so on, but themselves don't have necessarily the ability uh, to go and run a large scale study on. And of course, regulators, hackers, uh, our platform, OpenWPM, that I uh, told you about, that's part of the WebTap project. It's online, it's on GitHub, it's an open source project. So if there are hackers out there who want to contribute to this project, something that's in the public interest, we'd love to work with you. Uh, and in fact, this platform has been getting some use. Just uh, yesterday, I got an email uh, from um, someone at Carnegie Mellon saying that uh, students there were using it for a class project. And so uh, we're, we're really interested in building these tools that are uh, you know, by the public and for the public and uh, people can use to run their own studies. Uh, we have some information for the general public on our website as well. Uh, go check it out. We're also interested definitely in talking to companies in making transparency being a mutually beneficial thing instead of um, uh, you know, researchers off in the corner going and studying websites. So companies have expressed interest in talking to us. One thing I want to say is that sometimes companies say they're very interested in transparency, but then when you talk to them about the details, it turns out that uh, you know, their notion of transparency boils down to go read our privacy policy. Right. So that's 
uh, not a notion of transparency that's very interesting to us. Uh, what uh, I would really be interested in is some notion of transparency that's externally verifiable, uh, that uh, you know the public can be independently convinced of the promises that companies are making. So I have some ideas of how to make progress on this, and I'd love to talk to companies on that basis as well. So Sol and Barocus is going to uh, do the other half of this tutorial. Uh, let me just say this by way of introducing Solon. So I showed you this picture earlier of a machine learning system that takes users' personal data and comes to some conclusion about that user. Right? <laughs> and Solon, more than anybody, I would say, has thought more, uh, more deeply about this question about the ethical, about the social, societal, and policy implications of this. And uh, I love reading his papers on this topic. In fact, uh, I remember reading his uh, thesis that analyzes all of these aspects. And it was just a pleasure uh, because of the level to which he engaged with the underlying machine learning that you need to contend with in order to say meaningful things about the societal implications. Uh, and I remember describing my experience of uh, reading his papers as um, uh, finding raisins in a muffin uh, because there's just a, a burst of insight or flavor about, uh, uh, about machine learning and these technical issues that he's got in every page or every paragraph. Uh, and so he's going he's gonna to tell us now about uh, uh, discrimination and why we should worry about it and what are the different types of um, uh, impact and so on. Take it away, Solon. Um, I've got your slides in the file here. That's great. I'm just trying to find my mouse. Oh, oh right. <laughs> it's not mirrored. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Gotcha. Do you want to use this? Sure. Is that your first slide? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you, Arvin. You make me blush. Um, so I'll try to actually talk a little bit about what Arvin um, referred to in passing regarding the kind of tough uh, kind of ethical questions we need to be asking when looking at some of these results and what some ethical and policy questions might uh, drive this kind of research. And so I'll actually start here with a, with a, a quote from Oscar Gandhi, who uh, is a professor of communication, who's actually a, a longtime scholar of this kind of uh, work. He, um, he makes, the, he makes this point to basically say, like, to, to respond to privacy scholars and advocates saying, like, actually the issue has been and will always really be discrimination. And so you might ask, and I think uh, it's, wor it wor it's worth investigating, uh, well, what does discrimination really mean here, right? Um, the purpose of all data collection is, in many ways, to be able to draw distinctions and differentiate. So we need to have a more rigorous understanding of what we, what we object to when we say that something is discriminatory. So, what I'll try to do with the remaining time is map the variety of uh, types of claims that have been made about the discriminatory effects of these kinds of practices. Uh, and I'll do that by referring to various kinds of popular writing and, and comments by regulators. I'll try to clarify the precise mechanism that seems to render some of these practices discriminatory. And then I'll specify what principles seem to be employed in making those objections. Um, so I'll, I'll have a series of quotes, and I'll, they'll be much too long to read, and I've just kind of bolded the key points here for you, but I'll explain each and, and going through them. So Kate Crawford, another person who works on topics in this area, points out in, in, a, in a New York Times article that you know big data is not this kind of neutral thing. In fact, um, it is a way uh, to be able to draw inferences about personal characteristics, things like race, sexual orientation, and, what, and things of that sort, and that these inferences can be used uh, to determine what kinds of advertisements to present to people. Alistair Kroll, this is obviously a huge chunk of text, but Alistair Kroll, who is the chair of the O'Reilly Strata Conference, so one of the major industry gatherings on big data, uh, in an interesting and, and relatively widely, widely read uh, piece about civil rights and big data, basically points out that it's possible now to imagine a situation in which consumers' activity is sufficiently uh, um, communicative of their group membership you could simply look at what interests they happen to have as consumers and from that pull out things like race, gender, and other information that is legally prescribed in certain kinds of decision making. But because that information can be inferred, it can be used in those kinds of decisions like insurance determinations, uh, insurance pricing, uh, in a way that is very non-obvious, right? Because you can disclaim that you've actually never learned about someone's race or gender. In fact, you've instead been able to um, infer it. So in this case, what, what really seems to animate the concern is that there are new ways to infer membership in what are called legally protected uh, classes, uh, things like race, gender, age, disability, and, and so on. Um, 
In the first instance, with, with Kate Crawford's uh, point, it, it could be that you're granting undue significance to these facts when making certain kinds of commercial decisions, but it also could be much more insidious, as in Alistair Call's point, which is to say that uh, you're consciously and purposely trying to disadvantage members, and in particular, you're trying to do it in a way that obfuscates or masks the fact that you're actually doing it. So there, that the data actually presents, or machine learning in particular, presents a way of doing this in a way that would be hard to even detect. Okay, uh, Latanya Sweeney, whose work I imagine many in the, in the room are familiar with, uh, has an interesting result which basically shows that uh, when performing Google queries for distinctly black sounding names and distinctly white sounding names, there's a higher likelihood that the distinctly black sounding name will be presented alongside with a contextual ad that suggests an arrest record. And in the published work, she actually has a screen capture of her own name showing the kind of ad that you would be likely to see. And um, Latanya actually went and, and systematically tried to study this and discovered that in fact this was the case, that there was uh, a noticeable difference. And then she basically, uh, I think very reasonably, uh, posited that the reason for this is that Google's way of determining what ads to show doesn't simply depend on the price the advertiser is willing to pay for the ad, but rather the demonstrated interest on the part of users in that ad. And so if certain kinds of ads are being clicked on more frequently, those are the ones that will win out in the auction system which determines which ad gets shown. And what we then could, I think, very reasonably uh, um, infer then is that if there is prejudice that is driving who, which ads get clicked on, that prejudice will then be reflected back in the kinds of ads that are displayed because those are the ones that Google has good reason to think are going to be clicked on. And so here, it's objectionable, and this is, this is perceived as discriminatory, because it's really reproducing the prejudice that informs users' choices. Um, David Gladick, who um, was formerly the director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the FTC, uh, in an article in the New York Times, um, makes this point that basically, you know, what's really uh, unfair here is that you can draw correlations that are unsound. You could look at my, um, I look at the fact that I bought a deep cat fryer, and from that conclude that I have unhealthy eating habits, and then therefore bad insurance risk or whatever. Um, but in this case, in this example, he's saying, no, but in fact, that could have been for my friend. And so the real issue here is that it, uh, it's an incorrect uh, inference. Uh, Edith Ramirez, who is the current chairwoman of the FTC, um, makes a similar point uh, in a recent speech, uh, basically saying that certain kinds of inferences could be uh, unwarranted um, because, in this case, they're based not on concrete facts but on inferences or correlations. Again, suggesting the issue here is that the, the uncertainty and the likelihood that they may actually be wrong. Right? So, what I would suggest here then is that there's a, there's a whole class of concern around faulty inferences, right? Where uh, it's invidious because it makes mistakes, because it's drawing conclusions uh, on the basis of unsound, uh, unsound data. Um, and in particular, uh, one of the ways to think about this is it isn't just that uh, anyone can be subject to the incorrect inference, which is I think the concern which seems to animate David Laddick's concern, but, but Rather, that the way in which these kinds of errors get distributed in the population could be um, uneven, meaning certain populations might be subject to these kinds of faulty inferences at a higher rate. So, you know, historically disadvantaged populations, minorities, others might actually, uh, for a variety of reasons, be the, the victims of these kinds of errors at higher rates. Uh, Julie Brill, another commissioner at the FTC, um, points out that, you know, um, people can be discriminated against on sensitive details like health or financial information. And I draw a distinction here because uh, what's interesting is this is not a concern about discrimination based on faulty inference, but actually on the fact that the information is correct, right? That you're actually making a sound inference about, for instance, someone's financial status or health. Um, and what, um, and what is interesting here is that this really doesn't have anything to do with traditional notions of, of unfairness around discrimination that have to do with protected classes. It's simply the fact that um, you can be subject to these kind of adverse determinations based on correct information. Uh, and actually, Alistair Cole, in a separate piece, then uh, begins to think along these lines as well, kind of pointing out that, hmm, well, if 
if, if it's possible to actually draw these kinds of inf uh, correct inferences and to really be able to draw fine-grained distinctions in the population, uh, we might actually place some basic social institutions at risk, in particular, the kind of solidarity that is necessary for things like insurance. Um, and so what I would say here is that the concern uh, in kind of contrast to the others is that all the, the precision, that the precision of the inference is, is especially great. Uh, and in that way, um, it, it places at risk uh, solidarity, um, but also allows you uh, to kind of saddle populations with their proportionate share of costs in a way that might begin to threaten other important public policy goals. Okay, um, getting toward the end here. So Natasha Singer, a journalist with the New York Times, points out uh, another class of concerns which came up, I think, also in Arvin's uh, presentation, which is basically saying that this kind of data can be used to target vulnerable populations or people who are vulnerable to particular kinds of um, uh, appeals, uh, or uh, relatedly, that it could relegate certain populations to inferior uh, quality in the marketplace, inferior treatment in the marketplace. And so to begin, it seems to me that part of this is about taking unfair advantage so describing this as discrimination might seem strange, but it also ends up being the kind of same circle of concerns. Um, and so this is really about the concern that you can prey on people who are especially desperate or vulnerable. Um, and interestingly, and this is a point that Orvin also made, it could be in a way that is not necessarily blatantly the case, right? So people might have seen ads that are kind of about refinancing or other things to do with debt. Um, and in those cases, it's quite blatant that uh, advertisers are trying to find people who might be in a tough spot. But increasingly, I think the worry that Brian Kahlo and, and Zeta Tufeki have, have pointed out is that this can also be done in highly non-obvious ways, where you're able to kind of either intentionally or through machine learning discover modes of persuasion which are highly effective but are very non-evident in the, in the way that they're actually uh, achieving that degree of, of effectiveness. Okay. Um, and then the final point here, I think, is that it's also the case that, um, and this is, the, this is drawn, I think, again, from the, Natasha's um, point, that um, there's a whole other set of concerns that are really about inequality. So it may well be that correct information used to, to make accurate inferences um, simply recapitulates the inequality that happens to exist in society, and in particular, that better or more data will just simply expose the, the exact extent of inequality in society. Uh, and perhaps even more worrisome, it is possible too that the very same qualities that seem to be relevant in determining who is a good customer, who is the most profitable customer, correlate with class membership in some way. And so in deciding how to treat customers differently, you're also perhaps unintentionally discovering that you should treat certain classes, certain races, uh, more or less favorably. Um, and in many cases, what is going to be very tricky is that making rational decisions as a business may mean considering criteria that are highly correlated with class membership uh, to the degree that becomes, I think, very tricky to, to figure out what to do. And so um, I'll try to wrap up by saying that there really is a, a variety of unfairness of unfairnesses uh, that are kind of animating these concerns. And I think we need to try to bring greater precision and clarity to which, which kind of unfairness seems to be at work in our objections and what worries of unfairness seem to be motivating uh, our studies. I think it's important, though, that discrimination has been and continues to be a way to describe all these concerns. And I'll just end by trying to give a kind of summary that provides a way of making sense of the different things I've, I've described. So it seems to me that there are really three different mechanisms at work in the, in the things I've presented. One uh, is this conscious intention to disadvantage members of particular classes and to do it in ways that involve inference and are therefore very hard to detect. Um, and this is kind of one of the, the, the more obviously worrisome uh, concerns, but I think the others actually warrant um, more, more attention. So the second being um, that there are certain problems with the data mining process itself that machine learning uh, invariably will result in inferential errors and that these errors can be distributed in a way uh, that is quite uneven. And finally, uh, that there are certain unwelcome effects uh, to, uh, to granting certain decision makers, certain companies, certain, pe uh, certain actors, greater powers of discernment. Uh, when you're really able to disaggregate the population and draw especially precise distinctions, uh, you might end up having certain concerns. And so here is the kind of 
my attempt to, to translate those mechanisms into these specific concerns. And so one is, of course, with prejudicial decision making, and it's masking, as I mentioned. The other is with concerns with bias and error, uh, which is different than prejudice, and those distribution of those kinds of errors. Um, there's concerns here, as I mentioned, with solidarity and the perpetuation of inequality, even when the decisions are sound. And finally, I think there are concerns with undue sway and, and bargaining power uh, when you have this degree of information. And the last thing I'll, I'll say about this is that, in many ways, these, these different kinds of concerns actually appeal to quite different normative principles. Um, so the first might be that um, decision making should be fair in the sense that it should not take into consideration um, things that reflect prejudice, right? That certain people should not be discounted out of hand for simply belonging to a certain uh, social group. Um, and this is the dominant notion of fairness, which is enshrined in discrimination law, uh, and which really animates most, I think, intuitive understandings of discrimination still. Um, but the third set of concerns insists that even fair uh, procedures, decision procedures, can still result in unfair outcomes. And the law here, too, has a way of trying to make sense of this through its so-called disparate impact doctrine, um, arguing that um, there are, in fact, um, uh, reasons to be concerned with the distributive qualities of these decisions, um, and so calls for a kind of commitment to distributive justice rather than just procedural fairness. Uh, and, the, and the final one, which is about kind of undue sway and bargaining power, is really about non-exploitation. Um, that you don't want to be able, uh, you don't you want to be able to shield certain populations from from the kind of um, um, from the kind of situations where they would really be so desperate that they have no choices at all, right? Um, and so I think it's really important then, in, in the research that we we uh, will discuss today, and that hopefully the research that will continue in the future, that we think uh, about how to translate some of these concerns into. Um, into practical questions that can, can animate this research and that can, I think, inform some of the debate that has been happening around this uh, topic. And I'll simply say then, to end, that in general, so far, uh, people have tended to focus on the more obvious version of this concern, which is to say, uh, we want to make sure the decision procedure is fair, when in fact, increasingly, I think now, people are becoming more comfortable with the idea that we have to think more broadly about uh, not just the decision procedure itself, uh, but the outcomes of those, of those decisions. Um, and so this is, I think, the kind of shift in the discussion that we're experiencing now, and I encourage uh, the computer science community to be involved in that shift as well. So thanks very much. Yeah. So I think we have time to either take a few questions or we can adjourn slightly earlier for break. I'm inclined to take questions if people have any. Please, and Arvin, I had questions for Arvin as well. Please. Uh, my experience seems to be that uh, these uh, procedures to give me ads are pretty dumb. Uh, I mean, it's a question whether there's artificial intelligence. There's certainly a lot of artificial stupidity out there. But uh, it, it's, um, it, it also is very slow. So assembling these ads from 20, 30 different directions it slows the websites way down. And I wonder if you have a comment on the social implication of that. I'll comment and I'll allow Arvin to comment too if you want. Interestingly, I think um, this concern about ads being um, mistargeted often end up being ways that people perceive it as being unthreatening. So the data is so bad, or the ads are so poorly targeted that there actually is nothing to worry about. Right? So in a way, the simplicity of the targeting schema uh, is, in fact, something that reassures us that there's nothing to worry about. Um, I don't think, though, that should be the, the, the reason to, to kind of remain comfortable with the situation now. I take it, though, that the question is, um, Will it, will it improve, or should, I mean, is your question? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's just pretty, the state of the art seems to be pretty dumb, even with that panoply of uh, hundreds of uh, middlewares that, that are between <laughs> us and, and the uh, advertisers. Uh, yeah, so I think what it also reflects is um, 
what counts as uh, a success in this industry um, is really marginal gains. And because it's such a huge number of people who are being exposed to ads, even you know, like a 0.1% like a increase in, in click-through is a meaningful change. Um, so even if it seems at a certain level um, not particularly sophisticated, uh, it may still be perceived for, for, I think, legitimate reasons as an improvement. I'll, uh, I'll give a slightly different answer to that question. I think what is undeniably true is that companies who are doing ad tech and ad targeting are hiring the smartest kids out of Stanford and Princeton in, in tremendous numbers, to the point that this has become a meme in Silicon Valley and is considered some sort of, uh, it, it, you know, as sort of a social problem in Silicon Valley. There's a famous quote from Jeff Hammerbacher, who's a data scientist, going around saying, uh, roughly, we live in a world where the smartest people are you know, make, figuring out how to better get people to click on ads instead of uh, solving the world's problems. So it might be true that ads are still dumb, but I assure you that Silicon Valley is rapidly trying to fix that problem, right? And, and in the ad tech uh, world in New York as well. Um, and, and the other thing I want to point out, and this is uh, very similar, I think, to what Solon said, is that something that might appear as dumb to the consumer might still be very economically rational and clever in a way and sophisticated from the point of view of the ad targeting ecosystem. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't have uh, ethical or discriminatory effects. So that's uh, something to keep in mind. Question in the back. Actually, it's a comment. Oh, yeah, Roxana, go ahead. Uh, it's a, you know, in response, this is an example. Um, uh, it might appear, for example, that it's exactly the same ad over and over and over again. Uh, you know, it's, it's dumb because, you know, you've just seen it, so you have to get the message in your time. But it, it turns out that this is actually a very effective scheme, uh, you know, of, of targeting, so of retargeting, and the ad is following you, and it's influenced you, and you can show that it actually that's a great point. Thank you. Yeah. Did we have another question as well? Jeannie, go ahead. I just wanted, first of all, to thank you for doing the research because it will help people like me who are trying to find these things Wonderful. under a self-regulatory regime. I'm a little disappointed that you didn't mention that that's a group those who are trying self-regulatory enforcement that should be up on your circle. I, so what happened there was that circle initially contained regulatory and self-regulatory. It didn't fit in the circle. And uh, I should have mentioned verbally that what I meant by regulatory definitely includes self-regulators. Uh, I know that uh, you know we've had conversations, I've had great conversations with uh, Mark Roman at the NAI. I do hope that a partnership along those lines can develop. Yeah. And I think that would be a wonderful outcome. We, we really do too. And we are extremely grateful that there will be better ways of detecting some things that may lead to invidious discrimination and that also are forbidden under our principles. But as you've all pointed out, they're extraordinarily difficult to find. And if I may, just one final comment. Please. In the discussions, I think it's really important to do what we're trying to do as you talk to us. And that is be careful to make judgments based on what is harmful and go for that rather than the red shoes are falling. I feel like we've wasted a lot of time just getting ourselves as regulators acquainted with this phenomenon rather than where we are beginning to be now to look at where the harms are. Thank you. I, I just think that that is really important. That gavel that you showed so long is so important. When is the decision being made? When are you being placed in a bubble? When don't you have the intelligence, the information, or the ability to go beyond what might be just an offer that is not offered? We need to educate consumers about that. And I thought that was a great point that we don't, we, consumers don't understand. Thanks for your comment, and I'm glad you accepted uh, our invitation to be on the panel. I'm looking forward to the discussion we're going to have on the policy panel uh, this afternoon. Uh, do we have time for one last comment, perhaps? Zeta, go ahead. Uh, great talk this morning. Um, 
I have a question, which is, in a sense, like, this is very much putting under scrutiny what data miners do or data analysts do. So what does it mean to, my first question was, what does it mean to expect data analysts to correct something that's wrong in society? Um, which kind of leads me to the second question, which is, what are the different roles that this data sets and the analysis that it contains can play? So on the one hand, it could lead to unfairness, but it could also help recognize unfairness. I would love to hear a little about that. Yeah, it's an absolutely great question and one that other people have posed uh, to me before, so thanks, Sita. Um I think you're exactly right. There are really fundamental questions about uh, who are the appropriate actors or possibly the correct institutions to solve some of the problems that are being either um, exacerbated uh, or kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, extended here. Um, and it's not clear that in all instances the right person to to uh, to thrust responsibility on is is the data miners or the companies that they work for. Um, so especially for questions around inequality, it's not clear that the right way to do this would be to to kind of make companies individually responsible for trying to minimize the fact that their business practice has a disparate impact on consumers, right? But it may well be that in certain other instances there's a, a serious moral onus. So I think in in the kind of work that Latanya has done. Um, I don't think companies, for a variety of reasons, want to be responsible for perpetuating, even unknowingly, the kinds of prejudice that society might still, you know, um, still have. Um, so I think it's going to be a, an important discussion to have, and I think that there are some cases which are more obviously um, those where, where there is a role to play on the part of the data miners and the companies they work for, whereas others, I think, actually are genuinely basic questions about, you know, who is the appropriate institution which is the appropriate institution to solve some of these basic questions. So regarding the second question, though, and this will be my, I think, the end, um, that's exactly right also, which is uh, data can play a role in, in exposing and addressing discrimination uh, and in achieving greater kinds of fairness. And so what I'll mention, too, is that um, separate from this, uh, some people here at Princeton, including Ed Felton, another graduate student, uh, Josh Kroll, and others, um, Joanna, here in the, in the group too, uh, are working on um, trying to figure out how to bring computational tools to bear on questions of fairness. So using data and other computational techniques to actually ensure fairness in decision making uh, or to be able to reason more rigorously about the kind of fairness of certain outcomes. Um, so I, I think there's a huge role to play uh, and it is important too in that instance that, that computer scientists be involved and so I'm really excited that, that there is uh, movement in that area as well. And, um, I hope among, uh, aside from this, that computer scientists also get involved in those efforts. So, um, okay, thanks very much, folks. Uh, we have a 15 minute break, two minute break, I guess. Just okay, a short break, uh, a break where we can get up and, and walk around quickly, but then come right back. So thanks very much.